seated. Thank you for coming this morning. It's a blessing to have you here in God's house. Take your Bibles, turn to the gospel or to the book of Acts, chapter number 22, verse 30. It's where we're going to begin, chapter number 22, verse number 30. And uh, when we left off last week, uh, we left off with the Apostle Paul uh, had been arrested. He had been carried out. They had uh, beat him. He had, was in a mess, y'all. I mean, it was a mess. And, and we find that they uh, was fixing to scourge him. And he told them he was a Roman citizen. As he told him he was a Roman citizen, that was against the law. They couldn't do that. So uh, Lysias, who was the head of uh, the centurions there on the temple guard with the temple guard, he brought them out, took them out, and shared him and brought the Sanhedrin. So that's where we're at this morning in chapter 22, verse number 30. Now, I share that with you so that you'll be caught up, so to speak, and some of you haven't been here, but we want you to know I, I shared in the early service this morning uh, as we were doing uh, studying the book of Acts, someone said, are we ever going to get through with this? And I said, oh, we will eventually. Uh, we will eventually, but uh, it's been a blessing for me. It's kept me on course, kept me thinking uh, where I need to be thinking, and, and I hope that it, you've been encouraged by the early churches moving and how God used it, but something has come up through this time, and uh, what has come up to me is what the word has come to my mind is opposition. Everybody say that word, opposition. And anytime there's opposition, uh, we find in the church, the early church, there was growth. Anytime there was a major something moving going on from Acts chapter 2. If you'll remember when the Holy Spirit fell, the day of Pentecost, tongues fell, uh, uh, and men spoke in other languages, uh, the gospel was proclaimed so everybody could hear the gospel in their own language. God used that in a tremendous way. 3,000 people were saved. Peter preached for 10 minutes and 3,000 people were saved. It was a mighty move of the Holy Spirit of God. And, and as it came about, uh, uh, what happened is that they began to find more difficulties and more persecutions and more trials. And went into chapter 3 when the lame man and Peter and John were going to prayer at the hour of the day and, and he said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. And then the religious people, the Jews, got upset. They got mad. And in Acts chapter 4, Peter was filled again with the Holy Spirit and he preached again. And he told him, there's not another name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Acts 4 chapter verse 12. He speaks to us and tells us, and throughout this time, from the beginning in chapter 2 all the way from where we are in chapter 22, verse 30 today, opposition came. The word opposition, the word opposition brings us to a definition. And that word de that definition is resistance or a dissent, expression of an, an action or in an argument. So there was a problem, there was contention. And there was a, a problem, and the, the opposition came from the religious people, from the Jews, from those who, who hated the way where Jesus was. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And they did their very best to stamp it out. Now, the man that we're going to be speaking about today, the Apostle Paul, was Saul of Tarsus, a very religious man. He was Mr. Religion, so to speak. And we find that Paul was very zealous toward God. He was very zealous toward God and he did everything he do to stamp out Christianity did everything he do but something happened to him on the road to Damascus that changed his life he did a whole turnaround 180 degrees and God used him in a tremendous way to birth the church write 14 books of the New Testament and throughout all the opposition that Paul faced everything that he faced God who was at work all the time folks it's not easy going through trials and tribulations somebody say amen it's not easy. It's hard. It's difficult. It's, it, it, it wears on you. It, it breaks your heart. It, it, it brings you to the place in your life you want to throw up your hand and say, God, I, I can't do this anymore. What I, I need you. I need you so much. I need you today. And, and folks, if we don't understand that how God's going to do those things, opposition began. It will continue until Jesus calls us home. Folks, we're going to have opposition in this world until he calls us home. Now, Chapter 22, verse 30, if you got it, say, I got it. The Bible speaks to us and says in the Word of God, chapter 22, verse number 30, the Bible says these words, On the morrow, the next day, 
because he would have known the certainty from where of the Jews, he was accused of the Jews, they loosed his bands, commanded the chief priest, that's Ananias, and their council to appear, the Sanhedrin, that's the court of the land, that's the religious court of the day, that's who would come before it, it would be like our Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin court was the court of the land that would take care of anything had to do with Jewish law. We found out and uh, uh, Lysias, who was the, 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 centur the centurion, the guard of the centurion, knew that he had not broken any laws by Roman law. But they, they were mad at him. The Jews were mad at him. They caused such a stir. Remember, they beat him, drug him out of the temple, thought he was going to die in there. And the Romans came to his aid, got him away from there, picked him up, carried him out, and got him away from that mob that was trying to kill him. And so we find that he was able to speak to them and share with them, and it only made it worse. They got even worse. If you read chapter 22 again, it tells us all those things. But now, as we find all those things, this opposition only grew worse and worse and worse. And you know what happened? The church began to continually grow and strive and see God do amazing things in the church. Thousands of people were saved. Lives were changed. Just think about the life of Paul himself when he was a Saul the missionary and he, uh, when Saul when he was a, a, a murderer became a missionary and God changed the really the known world because of that man, because of him, because of a, of a, of a, of a sage named Jesus who brought 12 men and 11 of them was his disciples and followed him closely. How did that man, through one man, change the way the world would go? Come on, say amen. Literally, because of him. And folks, that's what happens in each one of our lives. That's why it blesses me to see someone go into the baptismal waters because they said to ourselves, we believe. Come on, amen. God done that. I believe. With all of my heart, I believe. Folks, that's so incredibly powerful. And this opposition came as Paul came before the Sanhedrin. He may have known many of them. He served on the Sanhedrin at one point in time. He was part of that. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisee, a very religious man at one time, a zealot for God, he said. And so as he stands before them, they bring him to him. Now, the Sanhedrin actually was not in their courthouse at this point in time. When Lana and I went to Jerusalem uh, three years ago, we went by their, uh, 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 kind of like our White House, and very, very guarded. One of the men said to us, he said, this is one of the most guarded places in all the world because of the, of the terrorism that goes on there around Israel. And, and they had this. This was the, the place that they make their laws there in the land. And, and it was amazing. It was beautiful, big old thing set up on a hill. And, and, and I remember seeing that kind of reminded me of our White House and our legislatures and things like that. When we go to Little Rock, we see uh, the state capitol and how important that those things are to us as, as Americans. And, and, and we find that as he did those things, Paul would came, but, but they didn't go into the actually uh, uh, concern or bring the uh, Sanhedrin to, uh, to court in the courtroom. They actually brought it out in a side room, so to speak. They were trying to get things taken care of, and they brought him out, and they brought Paul before them because such of an uproar, because he was afraid for his own life. So look at verse number 30 again. We'll finish the rest of that. Start chapter 30. He said, The chief priests and their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Verse 20, chapter 23, verse 1. And the Bible says, and he says, And Paul earnestly beholding the council. Now, what does that mean, Brother Kim? That means that Paul, if you will, when he got down, when he, they brought him in, the council may have been setting up right here, he began to look them over. He began to look into their eyes. You know, it's kind of like on Sunday morning when I'm preaching sometimes and I get eyeball-to-eyeball eyeball contact with some of y'all. You know what y'all do? The first thing you do is hide behind somebody else. <laughs> you know, when I'm looking at old Chad back there and he's got his eyes open, he'll just kind of scoot over behind whoever there. He don't want to look. Jerry, Jerry Stanfield's really good at it. He'll get right over here and he'll move his head around. He don't want eyeball contact with the preacher, you know. And so when you look at that, that's what Paul was doing. He was looking at him and he was saying, guys, you know me. You remember me. You remember me when we, were, when we went to school together under the feet of Gamaliel, one of the most brilliant men of his time. You remember me. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I served with you. I knew all about you guys. Y'all know me. Y'all know who I am. And so the Bible said, He earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God to this day. What do you see he's saying? He said, before, I was a, before Jesus Christ, I was zealous toward God. 
I wasn't anybody. He was Mr. Religious. There wasn't anybody any more religious than Saul of Tarsus. He hated Christianity. He was doing, he thought he was doing God a favor by going into the churches and the houses and the highways and the byways and pulling people out of their home and putting them in jail because he thought they were heretics. He thought they were doing things contrary to the will of God. Folks, and I want you to know that he was very zealous. So he had a conscience. You know, folks, not, not a lot of people in our world today have a conscience. Say amen. But he says, I have lived in all good conscience before God until right now. He said, before I met Jesus, I was zealous toward God. After I met Jesus, folks, I want you to know something. He changed my life and he turned me around and I'm still zealous for God. Say amen. So he's honestly telling them how his life was. And those men that he was looking at, they knew him. They knew all about him. Many of you have watched me grow up have watched me have grow up from a boy in this community right, mowing yards and whistling, running up and down the street. Y'all watched me play ball. Y'all watched, and you know me, you've watched me raise our family. You've watched all about us and you've seen every, you know me well. So if today I was put on trial, I'm going to be eyeballing you folks. Come on, amen. But just think about it. He was zealous. He was saying, this is my testimony. This is my life. This is who I am. This is what I've done. Look at verse number 2. Verse number 2 gives us a, another insight. He says, and the high priest, Ananias, who had been high priest for about 12 years. Now, remember, Paul had, had served the Lord. He met Jesus. He went away for about three years, learned how to preach in the desert, came back, started his first missionary journey. As he started his first missionary journey, oh, he probably got let loose of all the council, didn't know who was what, didn't understand what was going on, or it didn't, it didn't concern him any longer. But now we find the high priest, Ananias, commanded them that stood by him to smite him where? In the mouth. I mean, folks, this old boy, but it, he, Paul just took a good old-fashioned beating. You know what? The high priest looked at that old boy, the big old boy standing there guarding him. Paul was standing right here, and the Ananias looked at him, and he said, slap the smile off his face. And he slapped him, and he hit him, and he beat him. Folks, that was terrible for that to have to happen. Paul just said, I'm just telling you guys, Folks, this is my life before me. You, you knew who I was. You knew me afterwards. You know what I've been doing. I've been on mission for three, three different mission trips. You know all about me. And I have lived in good conscience that I've served God. The Bible says, that Ananias, the high priest, had him slapped in the mouth. And that word, that word had, smite him on the mouth, means to beat him, literally, to beat him. That's what happened earlier in chapter 22 where they beat him almost to death before they got him out of that mob that was in a frenzy. Remember when Stephen was in that frenzy? Remember when they got a hold of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and chapter 8 when it was having a, he was giving his testimony and they was after him? Look what the Bible says in the next verse, verse 3. Now, then said Paul, God will smite you, you whited wall. He said, for you sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me smitten in the cup contrary to the law. What Paul said, he it jumped out of his mouth. Folks, I want you to know something. I don't know about you, but every once in a while I get in the flesh. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Glory to God and I'll get, my mouth will take off and before you know it, it had my brain still hadn't engaged. Somebody say amen. Yeah. I said something I shouldn't have said, and my, I got, I, my arms get to flailing, and I get fired up, and I get excited. Folks, my blood rushes to the top of my head. I get to saying something, and I'm, I don't even know what I've said, and all of a sudden, I think, oh, Lord, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Say amen. Yeah. That's me. So relate to this. Paul said, God's going to smite you. He, he busted him in the mouth. I mean, I mean, he might have had three or four teeth knocked out. You know, he might have been spitting teeth out. I mean, he might have called old Paul Snagley the rest of his life. Amen. But he said here, you sit to judge me after the law, and you smite me contrary to the law. He said, you can't do that. You know that, Ananias. That's against the law, and you know everything about that. Well, what happened was Paul now was speaking against one of God's anointed. He was the high priest. Next verse, verse 4. He said, and they that stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? Now, about that time in our conversation is when we begin to blame somebody else. 
Felicia made me do that. She just rubbed me the wrong way, and Felicia made me say that. That's how we want to justify what we've done or said. Isn't that right? Amen? Now, next verse, look what Paul says. Here's, here's what he did. He said, then said Paul, I wish not. He backed up. I wish not, brethren, that it was the high priest for it's written. He said, I didn't understand. I didn't know. He said, I've been gone. He said, I just thought he may have been your spokesman, but he was the high priest. And Paul says, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of the people. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. That's something we don't need to do. We need to pray for our leaders today. Say amen. God, help us to pray for our leaders. Whether that's me or Kyle or Cole, whether that's our staff here at our church, whether that's anybody that serves our Sunday school or the high men of the land, our president, all the way down. We need to pray for those in leadership positions. Say amen. God, help us. And Paul, he didn't, he didn't back away. He said, guys, I, I'm sorry. He is apologizing here for what he has said. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. It takes a big man to do that, don't it, Greg? It takes a big man to say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. Folks, that's a lesson that all of us at First Baptist Church need to mention. Say amen. amen. We all need to get that. Next verse, verse 6. Look what happened. Then said Paul in verse number 6. He said, but Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees. He cried out to the council. Now, Here's where Paul was looking. He'd been hit in the mouth. He had said something he shouldn't have said. He apologized for what he said. He was brought before the council. He looked at every one of them. He knew who they were, and he began to talk about it. The guy on this side was all the Pharisees. He knew all that. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew all about the Pharisees. He served with them, went to school with them, knew them personally. And on the other side, this is what made up the Sanhedrin council was the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in an afterlife. The Sadducees did not believe in angels. The Sadducees didn't believe in any of the things that you and I hold dear to. But the Pharisees, they did. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the things of God. The Pharisees believed in angels. Folks, I still believe in angels. How about you? This past Thursday, April and I went to Mississippi. Melanie and her family were there, and Lana was down there. We went to visit with them on Thursday evening, and we got to Senatobia. When we got to Senatobia, as we got there, we, April and I were driving. We turned off the interstate and drove up. We was going to eat. It was time to eat supper. And so when we began to get ready to eat, April said, uh, either Wendy's or Zaxby's. And we was, couldn't get across the road for Wendy's, and uh, Zaxby's was just up the road. And I said, where's it at? And she said, Dad, I think it's up here. But the sun was really blinding us. It was really bad. I mean, it was you mean right in the way. And, and so as we were driving, uh, uh, I, I said, I said, she said, oh, Dad, that's bright. And I was holding my hand up like this. And she said, she said uh, I said, is it green? She said, yeah, it's green. And so we went on through the light, got to Zaxby's, went in, went to the restroom, washed our hands, got, ordered our meal, and was sitting down. About that time, it hadn't been no more than five minutes. And cars and ambulances and policemen, fire trucks, I mean, they were zooming by us. And it was right down there where I couldn't see. And April said to me, Dad, look at that. We just missed that accident. Folks, I'm a guy that believes that God takes care of us. I'm a guy that believes that God watches over us. I'm a guy that believes that he takes his angels and gives them charge over his people. Come on, say amen. Uh -uh. And, and, and I, 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 don't, I can't explain that. I just believe that that's one of the God things. If you read the book of Psalms, he talks about the angels. And so here we find that when Paul perceived that they were Sadducees on one side who didn't believe it and the Pharisees on the other side who did believe it, he began to appeal to the court and began to share with them his heart. And so he knew they believed in the resurrection, the Pharisees. He knew they believed in angels. And he began to speak to them about that. Next verse, verse 7. And the Bible says in verse number 7, when you look at this, he says, And when he had said so, there arose a what? Dissension. Circle that word in your Bible. A dissension, he says, and between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the multitude was what? Divided. Boom. It split them. It split them. I mean, they couldn't agree on anything. Now, folks, this is the court that made decision for the, the religious people of Jerusalem. And now they were divided. Now there was a vote. Now it was a trouble. Now we find that there was dissension and they were divided. Folks, Satan is always trying to divide folks. Amen. And so we find the division was there. And Paul had appealed to them. 
And on his, I think Paul was a very wise man as he spoke to them because he knew there wasn't no hope for these old boys over here because they didn't believe. But he said, these folks over here, they believe. I, I, I believe they believe. And that, they'll be more sympathetic with what I have to say. Next verse, verse number 8. The Sadducees say there's no resurrection, neither an angel nor spirit. And the Pharisees, they confess what? Both. See, Dr. Luke explained that to us. They believe both of them. So, hey, why not? Next verse, verse number 9. And it said, the Bible said, And there arose a, and the great cry, and the scribes with the Pharisees part arose, strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit of an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. That's a God thing. One of the Pharisees jumped up and said, Hey, wait a minute, look here. Hey, I don't know what you guys got a problem with, but if we believe in angels, we believe in God, we believe in His will, we believe in the resurrection. And folks, I want you to know that this is the, if this is the God thing, you better leave it alone. You better back plumb away from it. See, folks, there's a lot of folks in our world today that keep fighting and fighting and fighting God. They keep fighting God. They keep fighting God's people. They keep fighting the things of God. They keep striving against the Lord. And folks, the Bible said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Look at that. And it, you see, the Scripture plays itself out. The Scripture shows us how that God does what He does. He says, that great cry, the scribe, those men who wrote those things down, those men who know God, and they find that we're not going to fight against God. We're not going to do it. Great dissension rose among them. Look at verse number 10. In verse number 10, the Bible says, and there came, or there arose a great dissension. That problem, I mean, the, the opposition really became even more evident. And the chief captain, we met him last time, Lysias. Lysias was the head of the centurions that were there at the temple guard, took care of everything. And Lysias, the Bible said, the great uh, chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have, and the Bible says, he pull, he, he, lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him, the Bible said, from force from among them and bring him to the castle. He said, listen, y'all go get him. So the second time, within a matter of days, they went, the Romans, and saved Paul's life. You say, preacher, golly. You see, they were the ones who had him jailed in the first place. Because remember, if you'll remember last time, they thought he was a murderer that killed 4,000 Arabians or Syrians. They thought he was a murderer. They thought he, he, he was in, an insurrector of the riot, and they wanted to know what he had done. They was fixing to beat him. Remember, that's why he had to go before the Sanhedrin. And when they was fixing to beat him, you can't be, I'm a Roman so I'm a Roman citizen. And the man said, I, I, got, I became a Roman by, because I bought it. And he said, I became a Roman because I was born free. And it was against the law to scourge. You couldn't do that. So now we find he's in that place. You know, guys, I've, <clears throat> I've always believed. I don't know what you're in. We talked a couple of weeks ago about storms. I preached last Sunday night about the storms when we went to Unity and preached for Brother Chad uh, at Unity and, and the revival that we preached on that Sunday night. We talked about storms, that you're either in a storm right now, that you've just come through a storm, or that there's a storm brewing on the horizon. And Paul, for his entire ministry, for his entire life, that was part of his life. He, he knew those storms were inevitable and they were going to come and they were going to happen. And he realized that and he understood that. And so when we think about these things, and, and they came and they got him, they took him away, they brought him out. And this great dissension, the Roman people, get Paul, get him out of here, they're going to kill him, so bring him out. And so they did and they brought him to the castle. And we find there in verse number 11, listen to what the scripture says, and the night following the Lord. Everybody say that. Who? The Lord. Say it again. Who? The Lord. Who was there beside him? Who? The Lord. the Lord Jesus. That's exactly right. Stop there. Right there. And the night following, the Lord stood by him. Brother Kim, he's already gone, dead and gone, rose again and back in heaven. Yep. At the right moment, at the right time, just when Paul thought he couldn't get any lower, guess who showed up? Look at that! I don't know what you're going through. I don't know where you've been. I'm going to tell you something. This morning, in those moments of, of discouragement, in those moments of depression, in those moments of heartache, in those moments of trial, guess who's coming? Jesus! He 
he's coming. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm here. Folks, I don't know about you, but I need that. Glory to God, I need that. The Lord showed up in the barracks, in the castle where Paul was at. In the middle of that, I'm going to say he doesn't beat him again. I mean, he may have had snaggly tooth. His mouth may have been but just every time his heart beat pulsing because the old boy hit him in the mouth. He was there, but the Lord stood by Paul. I don't know about you. But folks, if he don't stand with me, I'm going to fall. Amen. And I may fall anyway, but he's still going to pick me up. I'm glad of that. Man, I'm thankful for that. And the Bible says, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer. Folks, this old boy's in jail. This old boy has been whipped and beaten. He, folks are trying to kill him. And the Lord looks up and says, hey, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Don't give up. Say that, church. Don't give up. Don't give up. Man, look what God said. Look what God done. Look what he said. Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so must you bear witness to me. Where? That's where he wanted to go all along, wasn't he? You're not going to die tonight because I'm going to take care of you. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. And no man shall pluck them out of my hand, because my Father which gave them to me is greater than both. Somebody say amen. Man, look at that. He said, hey, be of good courage. It's all right. I'm going to take care of you. Take courage. Be of good cheer. It's going to be okay. I love you. Folks, in those moments when we don't know what to do, listen, I love you. I love you. The God that saved Kim when I was 13 is the same God that loves me when I'm 55, almost 56 years old. That's the same God. He hadn't changed. Because the Bible says in Malachi chapter 3, I am God and I what? Change not. Be of good cheer. You're either in a storm right now. You just got out of a storm. Well, there's one out here. Call Bridget Barton and ask her in, in Ormond Beach, Florida. Call those folks on the East Coast and find out what's going on. There's a storm moving out there brewing. They knew it was coming, didn't they? they call the folks in Haiti. Well, call the folks down in those islands because they've been through a storm. And folks, it's kind of like here, to, and a, if we have a tornado or a high wind, folks, it just comes and it just goes quickly. But folks, I'm talking sustained winds of 130 miles an hour. I'm talking all day. I'm talking long hours. I'm talking blowing hard. Folks, when you're in the middle of a storm, that's all you can see and hear is those storms and those winds blowing. But the Lord shows up and says, hey, be of good courage, church. Two little boys, 12 years old. One little boy was, on a Friday afternoon, he was, had his arm full of books. As he had his arm full of books, he was marching home. And another little boy was standing in his house, he was watching, and a bunch of other little boys came up to him. And when they came up to him, they knocked him down. They knocked his books out of his hand. They hit his glasses, and his glasses were all messed up. He was down on the ground picking up. This other little boy came. And he came to him. He started helping him pick up the books. And the little boy looked up at him. And he was kind of crouched down. The little boy began to talk to each other. And they began to visit with one another. As they began to visit and talk with one another, they became, struck up a good conversation. As they struck up that conversation, the little boy that came to his rescue looked at him and said, Hey, what are you doing in the morning? I don't know. He said, you want to come play football with us? So we'd love for you to come play football with us. Well, I, I don't have anything else to do. I, I guess I can. So from that one conversation, from the books falling to the ground, 
And he picked those books up. He helped him carry them as far as he could to give them back the books. The boy went home. They met the next morning, played football. And this other boy's buddies all hung out with him and enjoyed them. Man, they had the best day. They had a great day. And this little boy had a friend. They're 12 years old. They grew up. They continued to be friends. 17 and a half, they're getting ready for graduation. One of them grew up to be a star athlete. He was fixing to go uh, to Duke University on a football scholarship. The other little boy grew up. He's the valedictorian of the class. He's going to Georgetown on a, on a smart scholarship, all right? And this little boy, they, he's going to give the, the speech. And the boy that was on an athletic scholarship looked at the boy, and they were best buddies. I mean, they were tight, y'all. They were best friends. And as they looked at each other that day, the boy was scared. He was nervous. And he said, he said, I can't do it. I, I, I'm scared. I can't give that speech. I'm, I'm afraid. He said, he winked at him. He said, you can do it. You can do it. So the day of graduation came. They marched in. It's time for the boy to give his valedictorian speech. He walks up to the podium, takes a deep breath, and he looks out there at everybody. And he looks out there. I'm going to tell you a story about two little boys. These two little boys didn't know each other on the day. One little boy was carrying all of his books home from school. He said a bunch of other little boys came and beat him up and knocked the books down, knocked his glasses off his head, and they were all messed up. A little boy came to his, be his buddy, came to be his aide. We became best friends that day. He said, I look back on it now, and we were best friends. And this other little boy, the athlete, was sitting out there in the crowd, and tears began to flow down his cheeks. He'd never heard this story before. They'd been best friends. He said, but what he didn't know, he says, that was going to be my last day on earth because I was going home. I had all my books because I didn't want my mom to have to go to my locker because I was going to kill myself. He said, I was going to, that weekend was going to be my last weekend. That day was going to be my last day. I was carrying my books home so my mama wouldn't have to go to my locker. That old tear just falling down. He said, he saved my life in the nick of time. He's my best friend. Folks, I'm going to me this morning. You may be in the darkest place. Paul had to be in a dark, dark place. But his best friend came to his aid that day. His best friend came to him that moment and said, son, be of good courage. You've testified to me. You've been faithful. And Paul could testify to that. Take your Bibles and look at Second or First Corinthians chapter three, I believe it is. First Corinthians chapter three, chapter one. First Corinthians chapter one. I want to show you something. First Corinthians chapter one, just a few pages over. Because you know what, guys? <clears throat> we all need a friend. Second Corinthians chapter three. That's what it is. I'm sorry. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter. One, there we go, verse three, there we go. Everybody with me? Page 1001 in my Bible, all right? <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter one, verse three. If you've heard me do a funeral, you've heard this. But listen to what Paul writes. This is him, he speaks out of experience. He said, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all uh, who comforts us he says in all of our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them that are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God for as the sufferings of Christ around us in our consolation also abound by Christ the word comfort there in the Greek language means to take your arm put around them walk with them through that dark valley. Don't have to say anything. Don't have to do anything. Just walk with them. You see, when the Apostle Paul sitting there, I can imagine as low as he's ever been, praying, crying out to God, Lord, what do I do? Lord, people tried to tell me not to do this, not to come to Jerusalem. Lord, they tried to tell me, Lord, I just believe it was your will. 
God, I didn't want, why am I going through this, God? I don't understand it. Everybody else is gone. I'm here by myself. He wrote, he listened to what it says. He wrote it, he lived it. And the Lord came to him and stood beside him and says, be of good courage. God of all mercies that comforts us in our affliction. You see, folks, you've either been through something, you're going to go through something, or you're in something right now. Somebody's going to need you to help them to get through this. I don't know what it is, but God does. I believe God's the one that gives us hope. He's the one that gives us our help. He's the one that loves on us when everybody else walks out of the room. He needs a friend. And the Lord showed up in that jail cell right then. It's all right. Be of good courage. I'm here. You've been faithful. Hang in there. Don't give up. Don't give out. Don't give in. Don't listen. You're important to me. I love you. I care about you. We need somebody to love us. Be his hands. Be his feet. Be his eyes. Be his ears. Be God with skin on. Would you bow your head and close your eyes. Lord, I love you.